This is purely a journalistic point of view. Nothing more has been said in this video other than that of which has been reported by various media sources and backed up with sources seen at the end of this video. It's become known as one of the biggest debacles in television history, but it began as an ambitious idea mixing Americans' passion for football with the sports entertainment magic of the World Wrestling Federation. What became known as the XFL started under the auspices of entertainment Vince McMahon and Dick Ebersole and featured a motley crew of football players, each with their own amazing stories. While the XFL failed miserably, costing the WWF and NBC each a reported $35 million loss, its legacy is still felt today. Join us now as Behind the Titan Tron examines this was the XFL. The two men responsible for the XFL were media mavericks in their own right. Vince McMahon with his revolutionary transformation of professional wrestling from a regional business to a national one, and Dick Ebersole, the wonderkind who co-created and developed Saturday Night Live with Lorne Michaels, becoming NBC's youngest executive. In 1985, Vince McMahon forged an unlikely business relationship with Ebersole, with NBC optioning the WWF's late night wrestling special, Saturday Night's main event. The show would air as an occasional substitute for Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night's main event became a hit for NBC, with Ebersole benefiting from yet another successful project and the WWF learning much from Ebersole's production standards. McMahon and Ebersole became fast friends, and the friendship would last even after Ebersole became president of NBC Sports in 1989, divesting his interest in Saturday Night's main event. Ebersole reportedly even named McMahon as the person he wanted to take care of his kids should he and his wife pass away. Interestingly enough, both Vince McMahon and Dick Ebersole had toyed with the idea of getting into professional football. In McMahon's case, he'd saw ownership in the National Football League team, the Minnesota Vikings, only to be frozen out by the NFL's owners. McMahon pursued the Washington Redskins next, only to have Dan Snyder buy out the team. When McMahon learned the Canadian Football League team, the Toronto Organuts, was up for sale, McMahon decided to buy the entire league. He would change the league rules and run games in the United States and Canada. However, the CFL owners were concerned about McMahon changing the CFL's long-standing traditions. Consequently, the CFL chose not to sell, leaving McMahon to pursue something different. Dick Ebersole too wanted football on NBC, but not the extortionary prices the NFL were asking for. In Ebersole's view, NBC heightened the sport's popularity, with the NFL profiting from NBC's efforts, only to demand more money when rights came back up for renewal. Ebersole recognized the NFL's prestige, but felt the bottom line was more important. The NFL is a great sports property, but there is no property we would go after that will lose at least $150 million in a year. While the NFL was out, that didn't prelude Ebersole from looking into other football. Historically, there had been challenges to the NFL's dominance, such as the World Football League of the mid-70s and the United States Football League of the mid-80s. Ebersole explored a partnership with Ted Turner, where the two would form their own football league and air games on Turner's TNT network. However, cost issues proved troublesome, particularly with WCW losing money during the Monday Night War. With the NFL gone and NBC's NBA deal coming up for renewal in two years, Ebersole concluded he needed sports programming to replace the NFL before NBC Sports lost the prestige he'd spent his career building up. Meanwhile, the CFL deal had fallen through, but Vince McMahon was determined to bring his own football league. The WWE was branching out into more than just wrestling, and McMahon perhaps felt he could take his Midas touch for wrestling and use it to promote football. He held a press conference at WWF's New York restaurant in Times Square on the 3rd of February 2000, announcing his new football league, the XFL. McMahon ran down the NFL, calling it the No Fun League, promising to bring back the heydays of Smash Mouth football and appeal to fans of old school football. When Dick Ebersole found out about the XFL, he reached out to McMahon, certain the two old friends could combine their mutual goal into another successful partnership. 
Based on their past business relationship and friendship, Ebersol felt McMahon's Football League was a good fit for NBC as it would be limited costs. NBC agreed to put up 50% of the cost, air the program on Saturday nights and guarantee the product for two years. The deal seemed like a win-win, with McMahon getting a trusted partner and the prestige of the NBC network. In addition, McMahon negotiated with UPN and TNN to air XFL games on Sundays. Ebersol made sure to keep NBC's traditional sports broadcasters away from the XFL. Whether this was done surreptitiously to protect NBC's sports image or just to further the XFL's image as an outlaw football league, Ebersol reached out to other broadcasters. NBC's top broadcaster Bob Costas was wary of the XFL. Everything about it screamed to me schlock and crap. Everything that subsequently occurred validated that impression. In fairness, Dick Ebersol never asked me. None of the announcers who were associated with NBC were going to be used on this experiment. So there was never any danger of that. Instead, Ebersol hired Matt Vasgerson, who became a play-by-play -play announcer for the Milwaukee Brewers baseball team in 1997 at the age of 29. Vas Jerson was paired with Jesse the Body Ventura on the main game, but Vas Jerson was demoted to the B Show after one week when he refused to follow Vince McMahon's orders to point out the ogling cheerleaders on camera. He was then replaced by WWF announcer Jim Ross. The XFL was hyped not long after McMahon announced its creation. The XFL benefited from the man Dick Ebersol described as the best marketer and promoter in America and also benefited from NBC's advanced marketing. The XFL was promoted heavily as a return to Smash Mouth football. The rules would be different and the players wouldn't be high paid millionaires with bad attitudes. Instead, players would be paid $4,000 a game with a bonus of $3,300 for winning. While there was considerable hype, there was no stadium agreements, no teams, no coaches and no players signed. The XFL had little to present to advertisers, get other than the XFL logo and the concept. The XFL was slow in building up the infrastructure for a successful football organization. In hindsight, this was arguably the XFL's biggest mistake. The XFL decided to get additional publicity during a 6 January 2001 playoff game between the Oakland Raiders and Miami Dolphins. In what many saw was an omen, the XFL blimp crashed days later during a practice run, flying into a seafood restaurant, only the beginning of the XFL's notoriety. The XFL ended up comprising an Eastern Division consisting of four teams, the Orlando Rage, the Chicago Enforcers, the New York New Jersey Hitman and the Birmingham Thunderbolts, with also Western Division consisting of four teams, the Los Angeles Extreme, the San Francisco Demons, the Memphis Maniacs and the Las Vegas Outlaws. The eight teams would compete with the top teams, battling to see which two teams would compete in the season-ending finale, which eventually became known as the Million Dollar Game. The XFL featured rule changes designed to make for a more exciting and aggressive game. Instead of a coin toss to determine possession of the ball, the XFL held an opening scramble where a player from each team raced to see who could gain possession of the ball first. The XFL had no fair catch rule and extra points were based on rushing or passing rather than kicking an extra point. Unfortunately, some of the rules such as the opening scramble proved dangerous. In fact, the first XFL injury occurred during an opening scramble with Orlando free safety Hassan Shamsuddin suffering an injury that sidelined him for the entire season. Off the field, the XFL featured rules designed to make their game more like a reality show. While McMahon clarified the XFL would not be scripted, he and Ebersol hoped to capitalize on the wave of popular reality shows such as Survivor by mixing sports with entertainment. For example, XFL cheerleaders were encouraged to date XFL players, whereas the NFL banned cheerleaders from dating players, reportedly hoping to create romantic storylines. The XFL also was aggressive with sideline reporters taking to players following big plays and filming events in players' locker room during halftime. The league also allowed players to put nicknames on the back of their jerseys rather than their given names, with player Rod Smart gaining fame thanks to his nickname, He Hate Me. With a year's worth of hype, fans and the industry insiders wondered how the new football league would do in its opening game. 
The XFL's debut game proved a wild rating success as the Hitmen took on the Outlaws in a 19-0 blowout. The ratings were double what the XFL predicted were needed to be a success with the XFL earning a 9.5 rating, over twice the 4.5 rating the XFL had guaranteed advertisers. In spite of the first week's success, there was a troubling sign. The ratings dropped from an opening high of 11.7 to a pronounced low rating of 8. In effect, the game had lost a third of its audience by the end of the night. The first game had not featured the level of football seen in the NFL, but viewers seemed willing to give the product a chance. The question was, would they return for the next week? Any rating surge was killed the following week in one of the biggest disasters in sports television history. Things started spectacularly with The Rock introducing the game and the fans being treated to an exciting game between the Los Angeles Extreme and the Chicago Enforcers. Then 13 minutes into the game, things went black. For nearly 2 minutes, NBC aired a please stand by slide as the XFL's production team scrambled to discover why the power had gone out. NBC switched to a game between Orlando and San Francisco as technicians ran test after test, failing to restore power despite the presence of backup generators. 27 minutes later, the LA game resumed after technicians realized no one had bothered to fill the generators with gasoline. I wanted to break someone's neck, Vince McMahon recalled years later. Not only had the game been delayed by the power outage, but an injury to tackle Octavius Bishop kept him on the field another 15 minutes while medical officials tended to him. The delays resulted in NBC delaying the airing of a much hyped new episode of Saturday Night Live with guest host Jennifer Lopez. The episode did not air until midnight, reportedly enraging SNL's Lorna Michael. However, that was only the beginning of the XFL's woes. The ratings for week 2 had plunged to 4.6, a drop of over half the audience. The new car smell was already off the XFL and viewers quickly realized they'd bought a lemon. Over the next few weeks, the ratings continued to slide. Before long, the XFL was heading into record-breaking territory, but it wasn't anything one wanted to be known for. The XFL was on what seemed to be an inevitable course as the lowest rated sports program in network history. With the XFL facing sinking ratings, could Vince McMahon work the same magic he'd used to save the WWF during the Monday Night War? Well guys, you'll have to tune in for tomorrow's part 2. But in the meantime guys, please drop a like or a dislike, subscribe if you haven't already, turn notifications on, drop a comment down below, and I'll see you next time with some more wrestling content.